So uh, I came across a really interesting website back in 2006. Maybe you've heard of it. The site was called TED. Yes, that's right, TED. And this was one of the very first TED Talks that was made available online. And it completely changed the course of my life. Larry Brilliant spoke about using advanced computing and automated algorithms to automatically identify the outbreak of epidemics around the world in real time. This completely ignited my interest in applying new technologies to disaster response. So I joined Ushahidi, an African startup company that was developing really interesting mapping software. And this was of interest to me personally because I, too, was born and raised in Africa. And I was convinced that we could use this technology for disaster response. I quickly found out that, yes, I was right, but there were many challenges. Just after joining Ushahidi, a devastating earthquake struck Haiti. So we immediately launched a live crisis map. I went on Twitter, and I found dozens of Haitians tweeting live from Port-au-Prince about the devastation, the damage they were seeing. So I mapped this content as I possibly could, as much as quickly. But the next day, the following day, there was simply too much information. We simply couldn't keep up, and I didn't have access to the kind of technology that Larry spoke about in his TED Talk. So I turned to crowdsourcing. I emailed as many friends as possible at Tufts University and asked them for help. The response was amazing. Not only did all my friends show up, but many, many more complete strangers also showed up to help. We occupied our university lecture rooms and hallways, and we even set up our own emergency situation room in one of the study areas, where many Haitians from the diaspora joined us in our efforts to map Haiti live. This was an exhausting effort. And at the height of our crowdsourcing operation, the crisis map looked like this. This was the first live crisis map of a disaster. This map did not look the same for more than 10 minutes because hundreds of volunteers kept adding new content. It changed all the time. And this detailed street map that you see here, that was made possible thanks to hundreds of volunteers from the open street map community who used aerial and satellite imagery provided by the World Bank to create the most detailed street map of Haiti ever. This was an incredibly invaluable resource to our efforts. So all in all, it took well over 2,000 volunteers and tens of thousands of volunteer hours to create this live map. Now, I mentioned it was exhausting, but it was also well worth the effort. Because disaster responders in Haiti were able to use this map to save hundreds of lives. A year later, another devastating disaster struck, this time Japan. Within hours, members of the Japanese open street map community came together and launched their own crisis map, having been inspired by our efforts in Haiti. Hundreds of volunteers organized in Tokyo and across Japan. They worked together night and day for weeks on end to the point of exhaustion, manually mapping thousands and thousands of tweets, urgent tweets. The result was an incredibly detailed map, which is why the Japanese government as well as foreign embassies, made use of this map. But that's not all. You see, hundreds of thousands of Japanese citizens also accessed this map during the disaster. Why? Because crisis maps are platforms for self-organization. They are platforms for self-help. So this is what I see when I look at a crisis map. We're not all affected in the same way during a disaster. And those of us who are less affected obviously want to help those in need. So connecting these pieces, connecting these voices can save lives. And remember this, disaster response professionals cannot be everywhere at the same time. 
but the crowd. The crowd is always there. And the real first responders in a disaster are the disaster-affected communities themselves. So it's a matter of connecting this crowd, connecting these voices as quickly as possible to accelerate the response and the recovery efforts. This is key to building more self-sufficient and resilient communities. But manually managing all this information on social media during disasters is becoming even more difficult. We're dealing with tens of thousands of moving pieces. Indeed, disaster-affected communities are increasingly the source of big data. How big? Over 5,000 tweets were generated every second during the first day of the tsunami. 5,000 tweets per second. This is becoming an incredibly big challenge for the humanitarian community to manage this big data, this high velocity, high volume, time critical information. So clearly, we need to move beyond crowdsourcing, which brings me back to Larry and his TED talk advanced computing and automated algorithms. This is exactly what Larry was talking about. But we need to move beyond that. You see, we need to develop hybrid methodologies that combine, yes, the power of crowdsourcing, as we saw in Japan and in Haiti, with the speed and scalability of automated algorithms. So this is why I joined the Qatar Computing Research Institute, to design and develop the next generation of humanitarian technology. So one example of a project we're working on is we're looking to develop automated methods to identify urgent calls for help on Twitter during disasters. But these are complicated computing challenges. So if you're working in advanced computing and you want to make a difference during the next disaster, please get in touch with me. Come to Doha. Let's collaborate. Let's work with the United Nations, with the World Bank, to help solve these massive disaster puzzles and save more lives during the next major crisis. In the meantime, thank you, Larry and Ted, for the inspiration. <laughs>